Welcome to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network, a show that streams health, happiness, and hope to the kidney community. You can download all Kidney Talk shows from iTunes and find a variety of resources to help you navigate this illness at rsnhope.org. Please welcome your host, Lori Hartwell, who has lived with kidney disease since the age of two. Well, welcome to Kidney Talk, everyone. Um, Today, we're going to be speaking to Michelle Pace. She is a registered nurse, and she is a manager uh, and kidney care advocate for Fresenius Medical Care. And today, we're going to be talking about home dialysis. So welcome to the show, Michelle. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. So um, tell us a little bit about how did you get into the kidney world? I actually started as a new grad nurse, so my first job out of out of school was at uh, the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics as an inpatient outpatient dialysis nurse. So I basically went from the fi- frying pan into the fire, um, <laughs> and I did worked with pediatric patients and I worked with adult. Like I, I got a a very good taste of dialysis from all walks of life, and it was a great place to start at a teaching hospital. So I came right out of the gate in dialysis and I have really not left. (laughs) You know, they say that dialysis gets in your blood. And you notice that with a lot of healthcare professionals, like they just, they come to the kidney community and they just, you know, it becomes a passion of theirs. And um, it's it's a very unique community because I think it's really the only illness that requires such serious long-term maintenance with people who have the illness and, you know, you create some unique bonds and, you know, it's, it's like we're one big happy family. Some of us, we all feel like we're at a Thanksgiving dinner and we're like, I don't want to be with that person. But um, anyways, (laughs) it it is, um, it's very interesting how um, this community is so different from other healthcare communities. Uh, Well, it's so true. (laughs) I know. I know. I'm like, you know, as as the dialysis pump turns, right. Um, We, could be a soap opera sometimes. <laughs> well, you know, which brings us to an important point because I was on home dialysis. I was on, I was the first child to ever go on peritoneal dialysis back in 1980, 1979. And uh, I had been on in center hemo and I wasn't really feeling, I was not doing well. It was actually acetate dialysis, not bicarb, which we have today. And uh, when I heard this new therapy was coming out, my doctor said, you should try it. And I went on peritoneal, and I mean, I have to tell you, it changed my life. I mean, I became a functioning teenager again <laughs> and, and I was on PD for the next nine years of my life. And I, I really want people to understand that home dialysis is, you know, a great option if you embrace it. And the other thing is that, and I want you to explain the different home dialysis is, uh, you know, vascular access is also a big factor and there's benefits to doing peritoneal. So why don't we start with that? Can you explain the different home dialysis options? Absolutely. So the first one, as you mentioned, is peritoneal dialysis. And peritoneal dialysis uses your own body as a filter, um, whereas hemodialysis, which hemo is basically short for blood for those who don't know. And, and so hemodialysis, when we actually remove your blood and clean it in an external filter, um, you know, at this basically an artificial kidney. But with peritoneal dialysis, we we actually use your own body as a filter. The peritoneum is this lining that covers your organs and it's on the inside of um, your abdomen. And it's a semi-permeable membrane, which simply means that, you know, different size molecules can move across it or not move across it. And so we actually have this wonderful little (laughs) feature in our body that we have learned that we can use as that filter. And so with peritoneal dialysis, what we're doing is we're, we put some fluid into your, your belly and it dwells there. And while it's dwelling there, that's when the magic happens. So that's when the exchange happens. And I like to describe it as kind of like a tea bag when you put a tea bag into hot water and the, you know, how it changes color and like, but not the tea doesn't fall out, but it infuses into the water. And so that's a bit like, if you picture to peritoneal dialysis as you have this, this, you know, this wonderful area space around your organs, we put some solution in there and that solution pulls the toxins into it 
that would normally be, you know, you would normally remove with urine. And it pulls those toxins in. It pulls some extra fluid in that you cannot urinate out any longer. And then we we, we uh, remove it. So then we, we drain it. So there's a fill session, a dwell session, and that's when the magic's happening, and then draining and replacing with fresh solution. What? And so um, that's like a super simplified version, but there are two methods of it. One is on a machine, a cycler that does these cycles for you while you sleep. The other one is a manual version where you, you, you put some fresh fluid in, you disconnect, you go about your life, and it's happening, and then you come back and, and drain it out manually and then instill some fresh disconnect and well, go about your life. So. And, you know, I was on the manual exchanges because there wasn't a cycler available when I first started for the right. first three years. And I used to do exchanges four times a day, and I was really small, and... I'm still kind of small, but uh, I haven't grown as much as I would have liked. But um, it's, uh, you know, I carried like 1,500 to 2,000 cc's in my peritoneum. And and it didn't bother me. I mean, you know, uh, a lot of people say sometimes it bothers them. But uh, I really felt like I had more freedom because I could do an exchange. And, you know, I would do one in the car, like going somewhere. Or I would take it to work and do it. Uh, in you know, in my office, close the door. So I, I didn't have to go to a center three times a week, uh, which was a benefit for me, um, especially uh, with my lifestyle. And then secondly, when I went to the cycler, it was nice because I could just do the machine at night and then not have to worry about it during the day. But if I wanted to travel, I could go back to doing manual four times a day. So there exactly. was a lot more freedom with that. And, and you know, I think anybody who's thinking about peritoneal dialysis, there's a lot of videos and, and RSN has a treatment option like support group where patients share their experience. And there's a lot of educational videos out there. But um, I think that it's it's a great, great treatment option. Yeah, home, I was on um, Next Stage for about a year before my last transplant. And I have to say, just I'll just say it right up front, I prefer peritoneal over hemo. But they didn't want to do hemo. They didn't want to do peritoneal on me because I'm small in stature and I needed, I was list, listed to get a transplant from a, a living donor and they didn't want to mess up my abdomen with a catheter because I had had so many surgeries. They didn't want to add any scar tissue. So I had to go on hemo. But, you know, doing home hemo was, you know, I preferred that over going to in center. So maybe you could explain a little bit about home hemo. Okay. So, you know, I, again, I'm not really sure if your audience is predominantly CKD or, you know, or, or like chronic kidney disease patients or patients who are already on dialysis. But Hemodialysis, in the you know traditionally for many years, the the go to has always been this in center situation where people go three times a week. You have a chair time. Oftentimes, there's someone before you or after you. You go in, and again, they they're going to access. They have to access your blood. So, because this is the one we talked about earlier, where we're removing the blood, cleaning it in an external filter, and replacing it. So, we have to have an access to do that. And so, with hemodialysis, usually you have a fistula, sometimes a graft. These are, um, they're, it's, a, it's in your arm, typically, and um, it's accessed with, with two needles, and one needle will remove your blood, and one needle returns the clean blood. So that's hemo anyway. So three times a week, hemo is the traditional in-center route. Again, that's for folks, and, and, and as you said, it's much more restrictive from the standpoint that you know, you, you have a set ter- chair time. And if someone before you or after you is late or there's any problems in the clinic or there's any, you know, issue, like sometimes, you know, a clinic will lose electricity or they'll have water issues, you're really just on someone else's schedule. And and to do that three times a week for the foreseeable future, I mean, this is this is kind of a lifelong journey. That's, you know, basically you're modeling your life around your dialysis and people choose to, they, they choose dialysis to live, not to live on dialysis. Right. So to have the option to do home hemodialysis, you know, again, a lot of people, the idea of, you know, having needles and blood at home, you know, the machine is smaller and more portable designed for layman to use, first of all. And second of all, it's done more frequently, which is really important, just like with PD, because again, 
it's the more frequency of home dialysis that's really the magic. So you do it you do it more frequently, and you we're we're more accurately mimicking the body's natural function because again, your kidneys when they work work twenty four seven. Right. So if we're doing dialysis three times a week, we're doing fast and furious dialysis to try to tune you up as much as we can in those three hour segments. And that's, that's really hard on the body. The body's always trying to maintain that equilibrium. So the body's just has almost like a dialysis hangover. I see it many times. Many patients go home and say, you know, I sleep all day. I know. Or I, I sleep had for that. hours after treatment. I'm yeah. Like, I feel like I was thrown in a washing machine and came out the other end. Um, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so it's a lot. So, the, so it, you know, tr- now in home hemo, what we normally see is, uh, five times a week with no two-day breaks. And that keeps the person a little bit more level. It's like you're cruising down the road instead of um, riding a loop-to-loop roller coaster um, because, again, we're keeping those fluids and those toxins more in check. And, and with PD, it's every day or every night, as you know. So that, again, more, much more mimics what the kidneys were doing. And people wake up and they don't have recovery time or they do their treatments and they typically don't have this exhausted feeling because – it's gentler. When we do it more frequently, yeah. we're, we're, it's a much more gentle process. Well, so not well, only do they have more convenience, but they also tend to feel better as well, um, these patients, and they have less hospitalization. Well, when I was on in center hemo when I was a kid, you know, I was, uh, what was I? It was 12, 13, 14. I had no kidneys, and I was like 4 foot 10 and 9 maybe, maybe 8. I don't know. I'm going to say nine. Uh, And I didn't really, you know, wasn't able to drink a lot based on my body size. And, you know, that's really hard to do when you're going three times a week. And sometimes I would drink too much. And, you know, you just say, oh, I'm going to have a bite of, I'm going to eat that Chinese food because it sounds so good. And then you suffer because you have to drink water because you've consumed too much sodium. And then the treatment is really hard because you have to take the fluid off or it's bad on your heart. And when I went on PD, I was getting dialysis all the time. In fact, I was unusual. I had to eat a little bit more salt when I was on PD and I had to make sure I drank enough because I was used to not drinking. So I had to like, oh my God, I got to drink something. Um, And I trained my body not to. So I love the aspect of being more, you know, my diet being more liberal and my fluid fluid being more liberal. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about how long training takes for each treatment? So for PD, uh, we we do really like to teach both methods. And the reason for that is that, you know, should you lose electricity or have a machine malfunction or something of that nature – for PD, for that cycler that, you know, you, the one that you hook up at night, if something happens to that machine, you know, we, we can get you a new machine usually within 24 hours, but it's nice to know that, it, you know, if there were like, like in Iowa right now, you know, they had a bunch of storms that blew down like all the power in some areas, um, like the whole city was out without power for multiple days. In those circumstances, those patients can do peritoneal manually. They can do those manual exchanges. They don't need electricity to do that. It's all gravity based. They, you know, it's, you hang a bag and it drains into you with gravity. There's no pump or anything like that. And when you're draining it out, the bag goes on the ground. It literally drains out with gravity. So we want you to have that backup method. Uh, So we will train folks. Usually takes about, you know, it it does vary by person. Obviously some people are going to pick it up very quickly or some people, you know, there are variables. But 7 to 14 days for training is the average, and that would be oftentimes they'll train you one method, have you go do that for, you know, a month, and then bring you back and train you the other method. So um, that, but that is, uh, that is how that's done. So it's a a pretty quick turnaround because it's a, it is, the process is pretty straightforward. And you just have to have a catheter put in your stomach. You don't need a access, I mean, a catheter in your peritoneum. Exactly. You know, typically it takes two weeks, sometimes three weeks if you're diabetic and you're having, you know, some some folks have a little more trouble healing. But two to three weeks is kind of the national average. So for having that PD catheter placed and giving it a chance to kind of settle down and and, and then then we'll bring in it and flush. And if that works, it's usable. Um, You know, again, some people actually can do urgent start in some areas where they can put a catheter in and, and pretty much use it right away. Um, but they'll, you know, oftentimes have them lay down and just be sure everything's okay. Because it's, 
you know, it's a little bit of a more critical situation, and those folks tend to be more uremic if they're having that done, which means the toxins have kind of built up and they're really not feeling all that well. So they can't really train yet, but we want we don't want to use hemo if we don't need to on those patients. So we can, you know, in some areas do that. Uh, we really do, again, if we have patients that are formulating a plan before they start dialysis, they know what's coming, maybe they're being followed by a nephrologist, we love to have people plan ahead. If you know PD is something you're interested in, speak with your nephrologist because you can have that in place ahead of time so that this, it's not a situation where it has to be put in urgently. Since well, it does and it's, take two to three weeks. It's often a little challenging. We have some people who come to our support groups and stuff. And, you know, I'd say like 10% are like, okay, I got a plan for this. The other ones are like in denial and can't think of anything. Like, I'm never going to have to go on dialysis. So it's, right. uh, it's you know, it's hard to kind of be prepared, but it's important. But, you know, the shock, denial, fear, anger, depression, grief, and then finally understanding sure. acceptance, it's, it's hard to, um, but it's better if you can take control of the situation right. for sure. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, um, so hemodialysis training, uh, uh, home hemo. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and what it takes sure to get can. home? Absolutely. And hemodialysis, first of all, no matter, no matter whether you do home hemo or whether you do in-center hemo, having they, they, if you're planning ahead again and you're sure that's the route you want to go, the physician will be talking to you about an access prior to dialysis because it takes some time for a fistula to mature and be ready to use. And that's actually a little more time consuming than having a PD catheter put in because they, what they do is to create a fistula is they go in and they take a vein and artery, and, you know, and join your own vein and artery. And you have this, I call it a super vein that you have that, you know, is, is, can tolerate having those needles. In, right during your treatment. Well, and and then the dialysis catheter, hemocatheter. Uh, a lot of people, if they have an urgent start, they start with a catheter in their chest or neck, and right. you know but that's, that's always considered a temporary. I, I know it's temporary, yeah. but I know people have had them longer than temporary because they don't want to get rid of them. But it is the highest right. cause of mortality out there, everybody. Yeah, <laughs> they're very. They're. I mean, they sit right in your heart. And, and, the, and, of course, they're open to the outside because they're outside your body so you can access it. So if you think about it, anytime there's a break in the skin, there's an infection risk. And then knowing that that catheter, the tip of that catheter sitting down in your heart, should it get infected, you're talking about the pump of your whole body being infected. So, you know, you can unfortunately get very sick very quickly. And, and there is a very, I mean, unfortunately, they have the highest infection rate of all access. So we really encourage folks to, if they put one in you, understand that your physician's already formulating a plan to get it out because it's meant to be temporary. It's, we just want our patients to be successful. We want to, and, and you can't shower with it and you can't do this and that. It's just because we don't want to get in wet because of that infection risk. So it, it's, it's very limiting to like a, a regular lifestyle for a lot yeah. of folks too. Well, I, so I've it's, had, it's a, I've had um, you know, I have a cautionary tale of a friend who was afraid to get rid of it. She was, uh, um, and she died because of it. Because yeah. she got an I, infection that came. I mean, we've heard these stories, and you think you're not won't be the statistic, but the statistics are out there for a reason because they, it's it's very um, it's very dangerous. And um, right, but uh, but so I true. also I also understand the fear of being stuck. So right. you know, when you talk about hemo, you have to deal with needles. So that's why peritoneal is such a a good option. Well, and it's a great place to start. You know, I think if you can't, well, first of all, if you can start on PD and we will circle back to the training thing because I was I didn't get to you or I to know, explain I that just... email but but you know that the PD um, it's a great place to land in any way in dialysis if you can do we always say if you pee do PD because we're using your body and it's gentler we actually can help patients retain their residual function for longer right. and that's a very big deal because the more urine your body makes on its own, the better, the healthier you are. We, they've done, done studies. And even if you only make a cup of urine a day on your own, your risk for mortality is reduced by 35%. So the longer we can keep people making their own urine, the better. And PD, actually, it's proven that patients who do PD, right. are, they retain their residual function longer. So that's a big deal. So if we can start people on PD, if they're medically candidate, and that's obviously something to discuss with your physician, because everyone's different. But if you can start there, it's a great place. 
And also it gives you time to wrap your brain around the fact that should you, you know, you know, so should that ever not be an option for you? Because PD is not a forever option. That's an important thing to know. Your PD, your, you know, your body, like any other filter, can eventually, that, that, that filter we talked about, the peritoneum, it can wear out over the years. It, it can gets become, scar or it can tissue. Become scar. Yeah, it gets some yeah, stuff. You, yeah. said, you know, if you have surgeries, scar tissue, it, it's kind of like damaging part of the surface of a filter. It's just not going to do its job as well. So, it, so, as you said, you were on it for years. Some people can do it for many, many years, but it's not a forever solution. So it's important to realize that through your dialysis journey or through your life as a kidney patient, your how you how you treat may look different over the years, and that's that's okay. But it's a great place to start because it does give people more time to wrap, kind of wrap their brain around that that you know need to cannulate, which is a fancy word for sticking <laughs> sticking that access. Um, because it is it is something that's hard to wrap for some folks to wrap well, their brain around. Well, well, and you can learn you know home hemo while you're doing it like in center self care in the facilities. So you can learn a lot about you know, kind of the basics, because um, I imagine most people are going home with next stage machine, which is much Typically, simpler. Typically, that is kind of the go-to right now. Yeah, yeah. and they have some other ones. Um, uh, they have some other home machines that are coming down the pipe because you have to. Uh, and then Fresenius, some, I have some friends that are in the Fresenius home hemo machine, and they have their house plumbed where they can just, you know, the water treatment's there. They don't have to do that. So typically, how long does the home hemo program take to train? The average time for folks to train on home hemodialysis is four to six weeks. Uh, you know, it, again, it does vary. We're, we certainly have patients who do it sooner, and we have patients who take longer. And the big thing about any training that you do, whether it's for peritoneal or home hemo, is we're going to make sure that you feel good and we feel good about you going home. It's, right. it's not to say you're kicking you out after this day. It's or sorry. If you can't, if you're not, you don't have a lockdown in this day, you're exactly. done. Sorry, you only know how to get one needle in. Oh, well, go figure it out. <laughs> um, Actually, uh, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, exactly. So, so some, of our folks, some of our folks start to to do needles in, like may, they may be in center and they're thinking about going home. Some of those folks will learn to start sticking themselves in center with the folks that, you know, have been doing it for them. And then if they come to us already doing that piece, because it is definitely the piece that takes the most time to learn. Once, right. If they come to us already cannulating their own access, then we, we sometimes it will only take three weeks to train them. Because the hard part is, you know, because that really is definitely, I would say that's, if you're going to have a tricky part, it's all downhill from there, you know? Exactly. Um, it's, you've got to so, overcome that yeah. fear. And, you know, I mean, there's been a big push in the U.S. to uh, uh, more people to go on home dialysis. And with COVID happening and some of the different things, I mean, is there like a waiting list in some areas? Like sometimes I've heard that some centers like, well, well, we can train you in three months because we have a list. Okay. Is that the reality? because it it, it is in some markets, um, you know, we do, you have to have training nurses who are qualified to train you and we, you have to have a room that's certified for home hemo. And so there, right now we're obviously, we're always building that infrastructure to make it a bigger, to make a, to make, to be able to accommodate more and more patients because there is a huge push for, for home dialysis because we know it's better for patients and because you know, we want patients to be in the very best situation. Well, you know, and that's just insane that, you know, here you have an in-center hemo place, and but you need to be regulatory certified for home. So, you know, a lot yeah. of times patients get upset that my center doesn't offer it. Well, go help them get it certified by writing a letter right. or something. Because well, it's... Well, and uh, it is, you know, <laughs> and I'm in Texas. We're, no, we're notorious for having very strict regulations in Texas, but, you know, we want to make sure that the, that we have the very best trainers because, you know, that's a big responsibility to make sure yeah. you know what you're doing at home and, and you have a good teacher. Not every, every, you can have great nurses. They're not always great teachers. So we have to find the good nurses who are great teachers and make sure they're qualified and make sure they know their stuff because we want you to feel like you have some, you, you know, you feel like you're in good hands. And then, of course, they're going to be your care they're going to be part of your care team when you go home. You know, they monitor you remotely. You come in once a month to, you know, meet with your interdisciplinary team. That's like your, the social worker, dietitian, right. nurse, and doctor. So we're still monitoring our patients. Our patients have 
a nurse on call 24 7 they have tech support 24 7 for whether yes. it's home or P- well, home hemo or pd and you know i always give the example of like what you said about training of nurses is like some people have the best m- cook who is their mother but they don't know how to cook and mm-hmm. and i'm like well isn't that interesting she's like well she never so the mother was a good cook but didn't know how to teach the daughter and so that's the same thing with a hemo nurse or something they may be a great nurse but they're not a good teacher so you need right. to have uh, and i've had some great home home dialysis nurses and they you know they they know how to they're just a different breed i hate to say it um they're more it's of true. like <laughs> And, you know, not that a hemo nurse can't learn it, but it is a different communication style. Um, I wanted to follow up a little bit about how much space do people need to do home dialysis? Uh, We usually say uh, picture a five by five area. Now, it doesn't all have to be in that same spot. Obviously, we have patients who put, you know, some, some supplies under the bed and some in a closet and some, you know, but we do want it to be in some place that it doesn't have to be refrigerated but we do want it we can't stick it in your garage if you live in texas like i do you know it has to be somewhere temperature controlled because we want to make sure that you know you're the that we don't change that kind of chemical <laughs> composition right. so um but we do we just say if you picture a month's worth of supplies as a five by five area um that would give you an idea of what and it would look tall. like in one big pile. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, how uh, tall? Yeah. Probably, <laughs> five by five. I'm like, probably okay. Probably about, probably five by five by five. You know, we're talking okay. about, you know, because you do have solutions and you do have filters and, you know, depending on which modality you're doing, um, which treatment option. Well, the benefit is you will have a lot of cardboard boxes to entertain your cat with. <laughs> I mean, it's that's true. for sure. But they are delivered to your home. And, you know, they'll bring them in, they'll rotate the supplies so that the oldest ones are in the front so that you're not ever expiring. You know, we have, it comes to you and, and, and the patients are taught how to, to schedule that so it's at a time it's convenient to have it delivered for them. You know, it's, we want everybody to have everything they need to be successful. Um, well, and, and, and we give a little buffer amount in case there's ever, again, like a situation where there's like a big hurricane or some distribution issue. Um, and, you know, that would yeah. impact delivery. We have you have a little bit of a window that covers it so that you have a few extra supplies for, you know, that kind of situation. Well, I'm going to shift because I'm like, you know, I'm like, oh, these young whippersnappers have it so good. They have people rotating their supplies. When I did dialysis <laughs> many years ago, they didn't do that. I had to do it. And, you know, what's really interesting is that I'm really good at shipping and receiving in my business today. I know how to do shipping and receiving. And I'm certain it's because I did PD for nine years. <laughs> I knew how to do inventory. And I always tell my, my um, you know, people that call me, I'm like, you know, all the skills we learn with this healthcare are transferable to work. Okay. All of them are. It's true. And, um, it's true. and so, you know, if somebody asks you, if you have shipping and receiving experience, you can say yes, because once you've done home dialysis, I say you can add that to your resume. Um, and it's true. It's absolutely true. And, and so they deliver that. And then with the waste, I mean, you know, I would break down the boxes and they would go in recycling cause I'm a recycling freak. And then the regular other stuff just goes in the regular, regular trash, right? And then the needles go in like a medical waste container. Right, and you bring the medical waste um, to us, and we will, you know, we have contracts to, you know, get rid of appropriately, dispose of the uh, the sharps, but you're correct about, you know, when, they, when they're done with their tubing, things like that, it's rinsed clean enough that that's actually allowable to be um, disposed of in the regular trash. And, you know, I've also heard, too, that sometimes, um, especially with home hemo, you have a, a larger water bill or electrical bill, and a lot of the utilities will work with you and give you a discount. That's pretty amazing. There, yeah, there are actually waivers for, um, you know, you can, there are, you know, and luckily, fortunately, we have, you know, a great team of social workers that work for First Sinus Kidney Care that, you know, can help folks with that, getting those resources, because, you know, we do have, Sometimes we'll have a landlord with a question or things like that if someone's renting. and um, But we do have waivers for those things. I've even heard, though, that even so, it actually doesn't bump bills all that much for most people. 
even if they're doing um, home hemo. So probably it's more work to get it done than the actual benefit. Like you saved, like I signed up for a Ralph's card, you know, and it's like you made dollar sixty seven for your charity. I'm like, it took me more to open that email and energy than the money that's deposited. Uh, so right. Um, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about you know care partner because you know when I was on peritoneal, I lived alone and uh, peritoneal. There are no restrictions. You don't need a care partner. I um, I'm pretty certain about that. But I think there's a difference of opinion with home hemo. Can you explain what your guidelines are about a care partner? Yes, and you're absolutely right about PD. There are a few folks here and there that may have issues where they have help with a family member. Their family member would like to help. You know, we do have some frail of folks or possibly those that have vision problems that, you know, may, you know, get in the way of them being able to do it completely independently, but we still have folks who do it regardless, and we're glad to help train any care partner that, you know, that wants to come along. I mean, we want, again, we want people to be successful and have a choice in their care. As far as hemo goes, the FDA has approved next stage home hemo machine to be used solo, so independently used. And and really that came about because they found out many, many next stage patients were doing it anyway, because again, they're treating more frequently. So those those, you know, situations that we might see in center where people are dropping their blood pressure or having issues like that, we typically don't see that as much, obviously, with home hemo because we're, we're doing it so much more frequently that we're not pulling as much fluid. And, and do you train a care partner, too, though? Do you train? Do they have you to have can, a care partner, but it's not, it's not mandatory? Some physicians, well, some physicians haven't necessarily, uh, they're not as comfortable with that, even though it is FDA approved. So it's really physician specific and patient specific in some cases, you know, they want to assess the situation. Um, you know, we have some, pa- some physicians who let anyone who wants to try solo at home do it. We have some that don't, that are really on, are not on board yet. Um, and I mean, that's just true. I think, you know, in the industry, you're going to have those who are more comfortable with different modalities, their familiarity with the results is different. So, you know, it's, and it is in the grand scheme, a newer modality or new treatment option to a lot of our physicians too. So um, we certainly, that certainly varies from area to area, but it's worth asking about. Um, but we do train care partners. Some folks, again, have issues with the idea of sticking their own access, but their partner can do it. Or maybe they have a child that is in healthcare or a spouse that was a nurse or, you know, so sometimes for that reason, they'll have a care partner. And, and, and the, the, they divvy up the responsibilities differently. So some, some patients do everything for themselves but sticking themselves. Some patients do everything for themselves, period. Some patients, their partner does a lot of it, but they set up the machine before they come. We really cater and individualize that to the patient and their family and their situation because, you know, we find that the caregivers burn out a lot less when the patient's taking some responsibility for that care and they're doing they're, they're really tag teaming it together. That tends to work out better because otherwise, you know, sometimes folks, it's, they can feel like, oh, I, I'm doing this all for you. you know? I know. Yeah. It, well, there's a little bit of family dynamics that come, oh, my God, you know, I got to uh, do this for you. A lot of family dynamics come into um, play when you have to rely on somebody to, to for a serious caregiver. So communication is key in those situations. That's a whole other show. Uh, so tell us a little bit about do people pay more for home treatment? Absolutely not. Um you know, I'm not sure how familiar you are with, you know, how things work with the bundle, the dialysis bundle, and how all care was yeah, bundled. Yeah, I know. Too uh, much for ago. my going good. <laughs> right. So <laughs> what it boils down to is this. Insurance or Medicare, whoever is covering this cost, as far as they look at this, dialysis is dialysis. So they're paying for the treatment and the supplies are part of the treatment. And so I always tell patients because I get so excited about it when I'm telling patients, and they're like, "Oh, you're very excited about home (laughs) dialysis. You are a champion, Michelle." Yeah, I've had somebody ask me before. You know, man, you're a salesperson, and I'm like, "Absolutely not. This is not one of those situations where it's an upsell or oh, for nineteen ninety five more. Nothing like that. It's it's just another option. It's just another way of supplementing that kidney function that." you need to help keep you help healthy and, and you're, feeling you're good and passionate. alive. I mean, passionate. We need passionate nurses. And um, I do believe um, that, you know, coordinating care is quicker with home dialysis. So you actually, your Medicare becomes 
um, available, you know, the first day you start instead of that coordinating of, I forget, is it 90 days? Yeah, and it can usually be retroed back if you start within, so you know, within so much time. So even if right. you, know, you end up in the hospital for a treatment, but you go home shortly after, they can that there are some benefits to that. And as, and especially, as you said before, the United States is really having this movement to go more toward home therapies. So they're doing what they can to try, they're trying, they're doing everything they can to facilitate this being a movement because they do see, you know, unfortunately money always plays into these things. A healthier patient is less expensive. Keeping you healthy is less expensive than having you get cut catastrophically ill. So they want home patients because home patients tend to have better outcomes because they're treating more frequently and they tend to have less hospitalizations, again, because they're treating more frequently. So these patients, it's kind of a win-win because the patients are better off, you know, the, you know, the payers are better off. Um, it, that it is, you know, most developed countries have been doing this for a very long time. Where right. you know the United States is is kind of a flip model of what you're seeing so many other places, and you know those statistics don't lie. And so we really need patients to just understand. Like if you choose to be in an infant or chair, I just want to make sure that's an educated decision. Well, so well, my we, job is to come out and teach you about your choices. We you know? say we say you know we're we're the United States and we give people choices. In other countries, they don't give people choices because they know people do better on home. And so they, like, you know, they send them home. And and then, you know, you kind of got to prove you can't take care of yourself. And then maybe they can go in center. So it's a little bit backwards. And I think sometimes uh, I hear from many patients, like, I like to go to the dialysis unit because it's so social. And I get to, I get to see people. And I'm like, but yeah, but there's a lot of germs there and a lot of people who are suffering because you know they're on the end of their life that's the reality of it and I would when I was in in center I mean I was grateful I loved the nurses and but you know you see people who are are not feeling well and it 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 impacts your psyche and so when I was on home dialysis I controlled what I saw and I would get involved with my friends and and do other social activities so um, that's my question for them is what were you doing before you start? Who were you hanging out with before you came here? Exactly. Would you not rather be hanging out with them? Also, if you get a transplant, are you going to come hang around with the dialysis exactly. patient? Exactly. I mean, everybody. No, you're not. <laughs> exactly. No. Or you need to go become a tech or a nurse or dietitian or social worker or doctor, and then you can come and get paid to hang out. So, um, well, and we love, that, you know, at Fresenius Kidney Care, we love that, that we love that our patients love our staff. It means we're doing something right, you know, and we and, and they do become like a family. But, well, it is. You know, it's Thanksgiving a dinner, man. Programs, there could be a, a yeah. brew hall well, if a lot you of don't our get home along. Programs have support networks too, you know, they, or they have support groups, or you know, there are, as you said, you know, there's a support group. You, you, you're, you know, there are many support groups and virtual support groups and other opportunities. But we'd much rather have folks, you know, being with their families and being with their friends and. You know, doing those things. Be with their um, animals. I have four dogs, right, a cat, and sure. a parrot. I want to specify anybody who does home, you do not have to get rid of your animals. And if anybody, like, I mean, it is, you know, and people even say that with transplant, like, oh, and, and we have the CDC, there's guidelines, there's all kinds of stuff. So don't believe, you, you do have to keep your house clean and your animals clean, but that's doable. Um, it you is, know, there are a lot of myths out there like that. A lot and so of it's myths. important it just, to ask Ask the experts because exactly. you will hear, you know, or you some of these and some of this information is old too. I mean, remember we've come a very long way since we first started doing home, and so there there may be people may have heard things that are outdated truths, and right. so it's just important to ask someone from from the home department because even some of our in center folks we have to continuously remind them that's not true anymore. That's not true anymore because you know their home's not their experts. You know, they're not experts at home. They, they don't need to be. They're innocent experts, and that's what we want them to be good at. But it's just important. If something doesn't sound right, be sure you're asking a reliable source. And we do have exactly. a great website for that. So they, they, as long as you're looking at vetted sources, go there and check it out. Find out the facts. You know, and, and, and before you make a, you know, make a final decision. And, and again, this isn't a limited time offer. At any point during your dialysis career, 
you can go from one option to another option. Exactly. Um, and sometimes people do. Your life's change. What was true for you six months ago may not tr- be true for you. Exactly. You know? it, it's, it's you know, if you choose to go on PD and it doesn't work out or doesn't feel right, you can change your mind. It's not a permanent decision. Well, in conclusion, um, Michelle, I, I think um, we've really talked a little bit about, you know, your, your diet's more liberal and, and many people who have home dialysis and... And, uh, you know, people feel better. I've heard that often, that people feel better. And if you don't, you can go back and center. And, uh, you know, I know that there was one place that took like a 30-day challenge. Like, you know, just try home for 30 days and see if it makes you feel better. Um, because if you're, There if, are transitional care units where you can go and experience the difference. So you can go for a couple of weeks and try try oftentimes it's a next stage machine but you can try that more frequent treatment it's a little bit more often just to feel the difference and many many times our folks who do that they're like sign me up because they're also seeing that machine and how much more this the machines are smaller and more portable and they have a green kidney that means go you know go, i mean they're designed exactly. for, it's, it's to be user friendly they're not bells and whistles like exactly some of those other it's machines. like a fancy ipad um right. and you know and it's really true i mean i uh when i got transplanted um you know i'm like oh my god i didn't realize how you know how i didn't feel normal like you feel different and you know we're just getting you know adequate dialysis dialysis does not mimic the exact function of the kidneys so more dialysis is better and nobody wants to hear that but if you feel like crap and laying on your couch all day what do you have to lose by doing some extra treatment it might make you feel better that may want you go live life um, so, well, and one thing to, I like to point out too, just before we do wrap up, is they talk about the time a lot. Like, oh, it's more time and this and that. There's a lot, and you know this. There's a lot of invisible time to being in center because you go there, you have to get there, so you have a commute. You wait to get on the machine. You, you know, you do your treatment, and then you have to, you know, come off the machine, and then you have to stop bleeding, or you know, there, you know, there's some things around that as well, and you know, that's there. There's more to it than from when we hit start your treatment to when we hit stop your treatment. And that's a lot of time you're investing. And that's if you, everything goes right and you you start on time. Because we know that there's a lot of variables when you're in front of your other people's um, mercy for, you know, the, your schedule. So if you're at home, yes, you, you may treat a little bit more often and it may come up to more hours a week, like than your actual treatment, because certainly that's the idea. But that, the, just all this invisible time you get back and the fact that, especially like if you're doing PD, you have to sleep anyway. So right. exactly. <laughs> why, not, why not treat while you're exactly. sleeping and have more you might well just, hours? Yes, you might as well um, uh, get your treatment while you're napping in your own bed. So, exactly. well, well, thank you so much, uh, Michelle, for sharing your, your knowledge base and passion and enthusiasm. And I think this is a good starting point. Um, we have a support group that meets, you can ask questions, a treatment option, there's a lot of groups. Um, you can go to Fresenius Medical Care's website. They have a lot of information. We have information. Ask your healthcare professional. Get informed and make the best choice for you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network. Please make sure to find us on Facebook or sign up for our newsletter at rsnhope.org. Kidney Talk is intended for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment from your physician. Always seek the advice of your own health care provider regarding your medical condition.